Who is Luke Belmar? Well, Luke Belmar uh, is an immigrant from Argentina. Mm -hmm. uh, went to the United States at the age of 16 with $200 in a suitcase. With a lot of ambitions, a lot of goals, a lot of dreams, but with a very clear purpose and a very clear mission to make it out, right? To make it out of this thing that we call the system. And as I drive through Amsterdam coming here, you notice the system, it's very prevalent, you know, how people live, how people move. And I always knew deep down that that wasn't what I wanted for my life. I come from a small town, 12 to 15,000 people in the outskirts of Buenos Aires. I don't know how much Dutch people like Argentine since we keep schooling your guys' ass in football every <laughs> World Cup. But it's good. Yeah, yeah. But our our king is piping down one of the hottest yeah. Argentina women. So. Hey, bro. Hey, <laughs> hey. You, 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 give, you give and you take. You give and you <laughs> exactly, take. You know what exactly, I mean? Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, at the age of 16, moved to the United States with $200 in a suitcase, mm -hmm. went from pr pressure washing basketball courts cleaning toilets, flipping uh, wings at a Buffalo Wild Wings, sleeping in my car for for a time being, it was about like four or five months, to eventually getting exposed to Bitcoin. I heard of Bitcoin in 2015 for the first time. And I, when I when I often tell this story, people are like, well, well Luke got lucky. I'm like, mm, I don't think I got lucky. I was exposed to information, but that doesn't mean that you need to necessarily act on that information. I remember watching a documentary on Netflix. I forget exactly what the name, I think it's called Banking on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman, they would actually go out on the streets. I think it was Wall Street and would tell people, hey, w would you have a Bitcoin or would you take this $5 bill? And everybody was like, well, I'll take the $5 bill because it's real and I can see it and I can touch it. So a lot of people were exposed to the opportunity, but not everybody capitalized on the opportunity. I remember being in a situation whereby in the United States, I don't know how it works in the Netherlands, but if you wait tables or if you work in a restaurant, you get your cash tips. So mm -hmm. in, in the United States, it's a tip system. Mm -hmm. But every day, the restaurant gives you those tips. That is your payday, basically. So I would get that cash tip. I would drive to the ATM mm -hmm. and I would deposit that money. I had a 1998 Buick. It was an old Buick. It was like a mafia car. I <laughs> fucking love that car. Yeah, I crashed yeah. it, but eventually uh, I had to upgrade. But it was a nice vehicle, nonetheless. I remember depositing the money. It was a Wells Fargo bank account. And since it's a cash deposit, you see the money instantly displayed in your bank account. So I would instantly get on my computer and I would go to an exchange called Bitstamp. Mm -hmm. And Bitstamp was an OG exchange. You know, it doesn't have a lot of liquidity or, or popularity right now. But back in the day, you could use your debit card to actually purchase Bitcoin on that exchange. So I would every single day use 50% of my money that I would make that day to buy Bitcoin. At that time, it was a couple hundred dollars, 500, 600 bucks. This was the end of like 2015, 2016. So pre the bull run of 2017, yeah, yeah. 2016, I got exposed to uh, e-commerce through a couple of buddies through the internet, which it was pre popularity. If you, if you may call it, it was yeah. pre, uh, before the hype, pre guru season, pre all uh, YouTube, all over drop shipping. This, Correct. That, and all so, the so there wasn't a lot of information. There wasn't a lot of infrastructure and people on that side will be like, well, you got lucky about that as well. You got access to e-commerce when it was fairly easy. And once again, what I say to that is just because it was accessible, it doesn't mean it was easy. Why? Because the infrastructure wasn't set in place whereby fulfillment centers were easy to access, payment processing, they screwed any sort of e-commerce or drop shipping because it was seen as high risk. So there was a lot of uphill battles, but there are different uphill battles. Today, the uphill battles are uh, you have, you know, your advertisers like uh, your advertising platforms like Meta or Snapchat, they don't like dropshippers because they have a bad reputation. Mm -hmm. They're high risk. So you get a lot of bans on that side. You still have issues with payment processing. And then you have competition when it comes to the barrier of entry because the barrier of entry is quite easy. All you have to do is open up a store with Shopify. Back in the day, Shopify didn't have all these crazy plugins. I remember mm -hmm. the, the app store was very new on Shopify. And I remember I would have to learn the basics of coding to like code in my own, the, the own size of my checkout button, the color of my checkout button. It's pretty OG. Mm -hmm. uh, did quite well in e-commerce. I rode the wave of crypto uh, in 2017 up and down. Mm -hmm. I wrote it down. I didn't make a ton of money. Why? Because I didn't understand market cycles. But I was like, you know what? 
I think I did 140 X, 140 to 160 X in my portfolio. I forget, but I lost it all. Mm. Right? I lost yeah. it all. And a very simple number to evaluate whether that's true or not is look at Cardano, right? Cardano went from half a penny to a dollar 60. Mm -hmm. I rode that entire thing. It was like two to three weeks. Same thing with uh, Tron. Tron, I think, went from like a penny to like 30 cents or something like that. And then XRP went from 13 cents all the way to $3.50. So I rode all of those tokens. I remember buying Bitcoin again. I still, I, th I think I have some videos of it buying Bitcoin when it crashed at like $4,000. And then a couple weeks later, it was up at 15. So it was a great season. But the issue was I didn't understand market cycles. I was left holding the bag because everybody was it, back in the day in 2017, it wasn't diamond hands like mm -hmm. they, like in 2020, yeah. that yeah. chant. It was the hodl, right? Yeah. The hold on for dear life. And I held on for dear life and I got fucked. <laughs> so I sat down there. I'm like, OK, what did I do wrong? What did I do right? What I did right was I allocated my money in an investment vehicle or what a lot of people like to call a high risk investment vehicle. And it played out. Why? Because money moves from different markets at different times. And Bitcoin has its cycles. After the Bitcoin halving, one, one and a half years later, the market tends to have a really good uh, season. Mm -hmm. So I was like, it's going to happen again. And it did. But this time I was prepared. And in 2020, after doing $16 million in e-commerce, did quite well there, had some money already saved up. I put all of my money into crypto except 10,000 bucks. Now, my entire thesis from that, it's not that I'm a genius, but I was connected with really good people. I was in the DeFi boom of 2019, so I saw Uniswap do extremely well. I was like, you know, there's something interest, interesting with DeFi. This was pre-YouTube videos of DeFi and everybody telling you how to open up a MetaMask account. It wasn't very popular. But that which is not popular is often a good idea. And the reason it's a good idea is because you don't have the normies and the average individual as a part of the mix. When the average individual is in the mix, it's usually the end of the season. When the mm -hmm. taxi driver is talking about crypto, when your grandmother's talking about crypto, who else is left to buy? Mm -hmm. Truly. Because those are usually the most uneducated, most uninformed, usually the people that are getting the information the last. The hedge funds are positioned. The market makers are positioned. The venture capitalists are positioned. Smart money is already in the game. And then what they do is very simple. They'll go to CNBC, they'll go to Fox News, they'll go to Forbes, and they'll pay the journalists to write articles on their behalf to do what? Increase eyeballs. Because the newbies, they read these things. And then the information gets dispersed, gets disseminated, and that information then leads to what? Attention. Liquidity. Yes. Yeah. And the liquidity is where the smart people get out. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. They get out on the liquidity of the noobs. So in 2020, I think it was uh, March of 2020, I remember using an exchange. It was Kraken and uh, Binance before they were cracking down super heavy on it. Mm -hmm. And I had my orders already placed. So I had orders placed for Ethereum sub $100. I had Cardano at half a penny, XRP at 13 cents again. And it was the COVID crash, you know, it was the big black swan event and all of these tokens uh, and all of these orders got filled, right? So I remember I was playing Call of Duty and I see my phone going off, zzz, 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 like the little vibration thing and you see the notifications, all this shit's getting filled. I'm like, oh fuck. At that time, I was kind of scared too in the sense of, okay, is this actually going to zero? Because mind you, bro, Bitcoin went from 20,000 all the way to 3,500. Mm -hmm. That was scary, right? But it's usually in the fear that you have to buy into it. And it's in the fear of missing out that you have to sell. Mm -hmm. And the markets are quite psychological. And when you understand that the psychology is actually manipulated by people, you can in some way, shape or form understand the cycle. Now, by no means am I perfect, but it worked out pretty well. I remember being on Clubhouse in 2020. And that's when the app was really popular and popping. And CZ from Binance hopped on there and he was giving a kind of like a clubhouse meeting with other crypto people I had tuned in. And I got the opportunity to ask him a question because I remember buying BNB in 2017 for two bucks. Yeah. So the BNB token, which went to 600 plus dollars, 
I was one of the first people that was actually buying BNB for $2 when the exchange was extremely new. Mm -hmm. I was a big fan of Binance. I still am. I think they're fucking dope. And that's no, no, no advice to put your money there because you never know how exchanges <laughs> are. But mm -hmm. I was a big fan of it. They've done a lot of good for the space and helping, helping it grow. But I said, okay, BNB, it's correlated to what? The exchange. So there needs to be if more growth factors and more kind of coal to the fire to keep the engines running. So at that point, I asked CZ, hey, you know, Uniswap has a competitor. They have, they're on, they need a competitor. They're on the Ethereum chain. And I just saw that you launched, launched the Binance Smart Chain. Extremely new. There was no YouTube videos on it. I think when I went to type on YouTube, the Binance Smart Chain, there was one guy talking about it from India <laughs> and then one guy from China. There was like two or three videos. So it was super mm -hmm. small, right? Yeah. It was just, it just got gotten started, just launched. And then there was an old guy, uh, some European guy that made a video about it on how to like connect it with your MetaMask wallet. Because you look at MetaMask, the default is Ethereum and you have to increase different chains. You have to do this yeah. whole like nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. So he said, well, you know, we're trying to compete because the Binance Smart Chain is going to increase the demand for what? For BNB, which is mm -hmm. the native token of the platform, therefore driving up the price. Most of the employees, most of CZ's wealth is attached to the BNB token. This is just how it works. So to increase demand, you need to create demand. So he was like, yeah, well, uh, there's other DeFi projects, one of them being PancakeSwap. And I'm like, well, what do you know about PancakeSwap? And he stuttered a little bit. And then he was like, well, I don't know. They're, they're, I think they're a team from Turkey. And he started giving me information. I'm like, well, if you don't know this anonymous team, how is it that you know where they're from? You know how much, like, how they're doing. You know that they're, that they're safe, that they're a uh, well-put-together team, that they're professionals. And they are. These guys absolutely crushed it. So I went back and I was like, dude, like maybe I shouldn't be betting on projects. Maybe I should be betting on people. And I bet on CZ. So I purchased at that time, Pancake Swap was $25 million market cap. Very small. Okay. Yeah. I purchased 1% of the supply for a quarter million bucks. And from 25 million, it went up to a $2.6 billion market cap. Yeah. I, sold, I sold, I think at about $36. But my selling point was uh, one of the co-founders of FaZe Clan, yeah. the gaming org. He mm -hmm. texted me mm -hmm. and he said, hey, should I buy SafeMoon? And this was the week that uh, SafeMoon had migrated from the Ethereum chain to the Binance Smart chain. And I said, I'm out. I'm out. Because this guy, he, he's, he, he's a gamer. He's not yeah. a crypto guy. Yeah. 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 And that's that's during the shit coin season. You guys remember when people of are course. creating tokens out of thin air? The ding yeah, doing coin and all the all bullshit. The bullshit. Yes, so I was yes. like, okay, this is the end because yeah. people are just making shit up. At that mm -hmm. point, I remember sitting in Mexico, 36 bucks cashed out and it went up to, I think, 42, $43. And I felt like I'd missed out. But thankfully, I rode that wave pretty well. I did quite well with that investment, made some good money. And the reason I got into crypto was in fact, uh, I had a buddy come and visit me at the time when I was making still money with e-commerce. And we went to a restaurant, well, a fast food restaurant at the time. I don't endorse seed oils anymore, <laughs> but it was called Chipotle. I don't know. It's like a Mexican fast food place. Yeah. And the bowls there are like $12. So I'm here with this crypto multimillionaire who's made a fuck ton of money with crypto. And he's like, hey, Luke, like he like whispers in my ears, like, hey, can you pay for my, for my lunch? And what do you mean? I thought you were like rich. I thought you were inviting me to, to, to lunch. You know what I mean? And he's like, no, well, I don't have any money. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have any money? He's like, yeah, all my money's in crypto. Mm. And I'm like, what the fuck, bro? Like <laughs> this guy knows something that I don't. This guy like understands the game. This guy plays well. So I went back home, put all my money in crypto and it worked out. Cashed out of Bitcoin at 55,000. Mm -hmm. Cashed out of Ethereum of at 2,950 or something quite high. And it worked. But you, so you listen to the crypto uh, crypto millionaire, but do you think like like we talked about it before? Like it wasn't luck that you met up with a crypto millionaire and that For he sure. said that thing and that you listen and then think like okay, now I have to go all in on that. But with Bitcoin, like okay, when it's on like fifty five thousand, right? Um, what did you make? How did you make the choice to get out? On that moment not later on or earlier there was three reasons one is it was enough money that based on my expenses i would never have to work again 
So it was like, okay, yeah, I can make more money. It was uh, in the multiple eight figures, over $40 million in crypto. And I was like, okay, like may maybe it goes to 60, maybe it goes to 70 Bitcoin each, mm. but like, is it gonna actually exponentially change my life? But if this shit crashes, right, it's gonna hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this point, it's not a multiples game, it's a preservation game. And I did not want to repeat the cycle of 2017, but mm -hmm. like that shit fucking hurt. That shit hurt. In 2017, I became a, a millionaire on paper and lost it. And I was like, okay, like, shit, I don't want to do this again. So in 2018, made my money with crypto, became a millionaire again, right? And then eventually I was like, I got to just multiply, but then I have to preserve, which is the, the motto and the premise of Capital Club to create, multiply, and preserve wealth. Because in every facet, the ideology and the, the processing has to change of how you think about information. But the markets are completely tied to the policy of the fed right so when the fed decides to print money or they decide to buy assets that's when the market pumps mm -hmm. and when they say hey we're no longer buying assets the market dumps and you need to correlate the people that work at the fed they they put out uh, it was a big announcement they said hey we are selling all of our assets because it is a conflict of interest for us to be in the markets while the markets are still exist Within 30 days, that was the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I sold when they put out that announcement. Yeah, It only made sense. And people can call it luck. I call it a game of possibilities. The more you try something, the more refined you become. And the more refined you become, the better you become. I could have easily been in a situation where somebody could have told me about Bitcoin. I remember telling a buddy, multi-millionaire stock trader, in 2017, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin get into crypto get into no it's a scam it's a ponzi no i'm gonna trade my penny stocks i'm gonna do my own thing mm -hmm. and he ended up buying the top in 2021 <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean so everybody eventually will capitulate into crypto because it is an asset class that will exist mm -hmm. and we go into a digital world you need digital money yeah. so from a logical standpoint it makes sense crypto yeah. makes sense and what we need to understand is that there's ebbs and flows of the market there's demand and at the end of the day there's also saturation at some point there is no more money for it to like, continue going and i saw that with crypto maybe i got lucky selling at fifty five thousand, but does it really matter yeah, <laughs> yeah <I have> to <laughs> that's <one> true <laughs> also do you notice that um not hesitating when you make choices is a really big part of the game. So even though you know you made a wrong choice, you did it without hesitation. Because if you keep doing things without hesitation and start making better choices, you start making the right choices while being sure. Because what I notice sometimes is you try to do something and even though you get better, because you know there's more possibilities, you start to hesitate about the choices you make and you don't fully commit. Did you have to go through the journey of not hesitating about the choices or have you always been completely sure about all the choices you made? I think it's about the information that you have and about the level of conviction because you have to be convicted about something, right? You have mm -hmm. to put your chips on the table about something. And the last thing you want to do is live the what if game. I can always make more money, right? Mm -hmm. I, and I, by no mean, means am I advocating, hey, if you have $5,000 in the bank, go put all of your money in crypto. No, go learn how to make money. Go learn how to develop cash flow. Go learn how to build a business. I had enough money whereby if I lost that money in crypto, I knew I was going to make it again, but it was a bet I was willing to take. And I took the bet and it worked. And I realized that if I lost that bet, I was okay too. Why? Because I developed the skills to build and scale digital businesses. So it wasn't a confidence on the decision. It was a confidence in my ability to make decisions Yeah. yeah. based off of the skills that I had developed. Yeah. And if the decision doesn't play out, that's okay because I have developed the skills and I have trust in who? Myself. I'm going to fuck up. But it's all a game of probabilities. It's not a game of luck. And you have to increase your probabilities by increasing your skill set. And that's what a lot of people don't do. They don't work mm. and they don't increase their skill set. Mm. 